For the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for updates. Hello and welcome to the Gist on Strat News Global. Hi, I'm Surya Gangadharan, and we are back to looking at the situation in Ukraine. Is it the end game? That's the question we are asking this evening, because there are certain reports that suggest this may be the cessation of hostilities, although it's still early. But I have a small graphic here for you that I'd like you to look at. Uh, the report suggests that Russia and Ukraine are close to finalizing a 15-point peace plan. That's what we are reading. The peace plan includes a ceasefire and withdrawal of Russian forces. Uh, the reports say a success would be contingent on Ukraine declaring neutrality. And Ukraine will also not seek to join NATO or host foreign military bases. Now, these are reports that we are getting. This is actually um, substantially the Russian position. And I presume that we'll have uh, more on that from our guest, whom I'd like to welcome. Uh, Christina Spohr, she's, from, she's a professor of international relations at the London School of Economics. Uh, she's also a senior fellow at the Kissinger Center for Global Affairs at uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, Christina Spohr, welcome, glad to have you. Thank you for having me. So um, you've seen the graphic that, we've just, um, uh, that I just played. Uh, is it your sense that this is um, uh, somewhere close to an end game? Is this just the position that the Russians have articulated, the Ukrainians have something else in mind? Uh, I think we are not yet close to an end game. I mean, we have had several rounds now of talks. Uh, and yesterday, indeed, um, in the Financial Times, uh, we heard a bit about the Russian position of the Russian demands, a 15-point plan, whereas Ukrainians, of course, said these are their draft demands and Ukraine has its own position. Um, and what, of course, is very interesting here is that clearly, you know, as you are in this crisis where one side has gone in with the maximal position and, and, and ha undertaken an aggression and gone to war uh, from that position as well as a question of if you want to come uh, somehow to a peace, you have to find avenues to get out of it. So this is where we are with these, with these talks. And um, like with all um, ceasefire uh, initiatives, of course, even if there were a ceasefire, uh, it often takes a very long time and they can be broken uh, until you actually get um, to a peace. So let's just think a little bit about some of these points that have been made. So, you know, of course, there is the demand uh, for Ukrainian neutrality, for declaring that they will never seek to join NATO. Uh, and, of course, that that should also lead to a constitutional change uh, in the Ukrainian constitution um, with, the, with the offer uh, of potentially um, withdrawing um, the Russian troops from Ukrainian soil. But we have to also remember how, you know, we, we, we got into this war. It was about demilitarization, denazification. Yeah. Uh, those were the sort of terms used. Um, and of course, we have to also think what are the treaties that Russia had signed up to the UN Charter, the Helsinki Final Act of 1975, then consolidated through the OSCE, the Organization uh, for Cooperation and Security in Europe, where there is enshrined the principle of sovereignty, the principle of inviolability of borders, and of course, importantly also, the free right of every nation to choose its alliances. So, you know, to demand constitutional changes uh, and, you know, to ask basically for a denuding of, of the state is actually even worse uh, than, of course, what we saw with, um, with Austria and with Finland after the Second World War. Uh, you know, if we consider sort of previous um, situation where under Russian pressure uh, countries had to act in, in particular ways. And, and the right also to purchase your weaponry freely from whoever you like. Um, is of course also um, you know one of one of the freedoms that is in treaties that Russia itself signed, and I think this is of course where you know negotiations will be very tough, because if you go against those treaties of which Russia is also a signatory, never mind the Budapest Memorandum of 1994, where Ukraine, which held one third of the Soviet nuclear arsenal, when it gave those up. Uh, when it joined the non-proliferation treaty and security guarantees were offered uh, by Britain, America and Russia 
for the integrity of the state, uh, then of course, you know, this really questions the whole uh, post wall post-1991 European order based on these principles that everybody signed up to in order to preserve the peace on the continent despite different interests. And I think one final point that's really important in this whole debate uh, is also um, this aspect that, of course, these Central and Eastern European states, the ex-satellite states uh, in the Warsaw Pact, even former Soviet republics, even countries that had been annexed into the Soviet Union, such as the Baltic states, they chose to approach NATO and EU, but in particular also NATO for security guarantees. So here you see this continuation, uh, if you so wish, of America as an empire by invitation. Whereas what you are seeing with Russia now is actually like with the Soviet Union. It's an empire by imposition. It wants to enforce what it believes belongs to itself. And I think that has to be very clearly stated. This is all part of the Russian narrative of gathering historic Russian lands and not mm -hmm. accepting that there's different nations. And in, in the meantime, since 1991, uh, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, states that through referenda gained independence, which Russia in 1992 recognized. Mm -hmm. But uh, we do have reports about uh, the Ukrainian president uh, indicating that perhaps uh, uh, Ukraine will not join NATO, that it's unrealistic, uh, that perhaps, uh, you know, um, there yes. should be some kind of neutrality. These, these reports have appeared. Absolutely. And I mean, look at it from the Ukrainian perspective. Now is not an opportune moment to even discuss uh, you know, joining NATO. I mean, this is it's, it's such a uh, would be such a provocative move. And of course, even to join NATO, even to even if when you make an application and then were you to be given a membership action plan with criteria to fulfill, of course, already in 2008, 2009, when this was on the cards, when Georgia and Ukraine pressed a little more, actually NATO did not issue those invitations because they also didn't think those countries were ready for it. It's actually the same problem uh, if you also consider, you know, EU membership. The EU has made very clear, you know, it's a very high hurdle of standards you have to fulfill to become sure. an EU member, socially, politically, economically, uh, in terms of sec security policy. So actually, mm -hmm. you know, in some ways you could argue that, you know, for the Ukraine now to even consider this, is, it's completely not on the cards because NATO would not even consider making such an offer. Mm -hmm. In fact, the war has made it also from the Ukrainian perspective and from NATO's perspective uh, inconceivable uh, to consider these kind of options. And that's where you see, of course, a difference uh, for Finland and Sweden. They are, they are of the level, they are interoperable, they're very, very close anyway, and they have to consider the pros and cons, whether it's worthwhile or not to consider a potential mm -hmm. a NATO membership, considering they are an EU member. At this point, Professor, um, when it appears that uh, the Russian uh, advance appears to have lost steam, that's the reports yes, we are reading, yes. but uh, Ukraine continues to be shelled, there's an exodus of uh, civilians, uh, would you say the pressure is more on whom? On the Russians or on the Ukrainians? I mean, the pressures on the Ukrainians simply because there's an invasion of their country and, you know, it's by a, by a huge neighbor with a huge military, uh, um, you know, mass troops that can be uh, brought in and, of course, a country with the most nuclear weapons. In terms of the threat and the power behind it, Russia can continue this for a very long time, especially if it cons uh, keeps its own uh, population under control and, and, and they're happy to go along with it and there's no uprising. However, you see, of course, that you know, the Ukraine, not just in terms of morale, but also operationally, has been able to really defend very hard uh, key, yeah. key cities, in particular also Kiev. And as you see in every war, every war, when you start a war, also from the war starter, uh, it's a risk. And we see, you know, Russia has logistical problems. Uh, Russia will need to bring, you know, uh, petrol to its trucks and to its towns. Tanks. Russia will have to get new troops. They've also lost thousands of troops, apparently. I mean, we are, nobody has certain figures, but losses have been on both sides. And, you know, after three, four weeks of war, there's always a need for replenishment, for re-strengthening. And that's why also with these um, supposed ceasefire talks, you know, we have to consider, is here somebody buying time so that they can actually replenish? That, of course, gives also defensive side also time to regather. But there's always a sort of natural up and down um, when, when you know, the waves of war uh, take place. And of course, you also have to consider, uh, even were there to be some kind of uh, pullback eventually, 
if it is about controlling Ukraine, we now know and we can see that there will be a long insurgency that, you know, mm -hmm. Ukrainians will not put up with this. And so this is not this is not something that if it was initially conceived as a quick, a clean a one week war, this has completely backfired. That is probably the biggest miscalculation uh, on, on the Russian side, considering that they, of course, come with all their big mass uh, into this action that they have planned for a very long time, clearly. We saw this, you know, with the arms buildup, this was planned for a very long time. Now, is it conceivable that the Russians have, you said miscalculated. Um, you mean to say the Russians, after having uh, spent so much time, I mean, they know the Ukrainians, these are their own blood. You yes. know, they have said that. And uh, they could have gone so wrong militarily in terms of their campaign. But or are see, they playing for time to negotiation? Is that what it is? It is, a, it, you know, this is fraternal warfare between two Slavic countries, of course, and, and nations. M many people, most people probably have relatives on both sides. Yeah. And that's why it is so horrible. But of course, you know, as you know from Putin's speeches, he more and more got obsessed with the idea that Ukraine is a nothing, that Ukraine is actually the heart of Russia, that they haven't yeah. got a right to exist on their own. He, he somehow completely misjudged that this country that has been an independent country for 30 years has its own identity. It uses its own language, that even Russians who live in Ukraine still feel that they want to fight for this Ukraine, for that type of country they're living in. Otherwise, they could have gone back to Russia over the last 30 years if it wasn't to their liking. And I think, you know, if you consider this, you know, how a despot works, how they sit in the Kremlin, how they only have around themselves advisors who say what they want to hear, you know, you start living in a kind of bubble. And that was perhaps reinforced through the COVID. And, you know, when people were in any case more isolated and Putin was more isolated. So it becomes like an echo chamber. And when you put on top of that a sort of 20 year building of narrative uh, as regards to Ukraine, but also as regards to, you know, Russia, Russian values, make Russia great again, you know, reversing the way the world order was going, saying, you know, I don't like this unipolarity. I want American recognition for multipolarity. We want a post-West world order, Lavrov said in 2019, mm -hmm. having the slightly unholy alliance with the Chinese, which is uneasy also for the Russians. It's a, it's a huge country on yeah. the southern border that is also not, you know, um, a very happy situation. And of course, at the same time, Russia orients always to the West. It's also the capitals are in Europe. The competitor yeah. is America. The competitor is a West that has growth, that has certain freedoms, that has a type of governance, and that's been attractive. And what's probably most vexing for Putin is that Russia's near abroad, in other words, the ex-republics, plus the satellite states have chosen uh, not Russia for security guarantees or for close alignment, but have chosen to turn to the West. And that, of course, links up with the saying, you know, the biggest geopolitical catastrophe for Russia was the collapse of the Soviet Union. He doesn't say World War I or II, which for most mm -hmm. Europeans would the, be the biggest catastrophes. For him, it's the collapse of that Soviet empire. So what would be... Um breaking point for Putin, you know, at the point at which he decides that this can't continue and I have to stop this. Is, well, is there a breaking point? I think at the moment we are seeing something very interesting. Last night he gave a speech where it's all about, you know, cleaning Russian society. I mean, the language as, for me is a half German. I'm German Finnish. You know, there's, there's language that reminds us of Germany in the 1930s and 40s, you know, cleaning out the society. Anybody who is sort of a Western oriented Russian, you know, has to be punished for their thoughts. So there's, you know, this, that's almost also Stalinesque how you, how you, um, you know, control uh, not just through censorship and by sending people to jail, but also by the narratives you put out there, you can control uh, the story that you're putting out there. But, you know, there comes a question. Putin went in with sort of maximal positioning. That's why he's different from Stalin going into Finland in the Winter War in 1939. The question yeah. is, is, is Putin, you know, mm, go, willing to go a step back from, say, in the Ukraine with a more minimal position and then see what else he can do. But in some ways, of course, through the sanctions regime, what he has brought onto his own country is not just destroying the Ukraine. I mean, in two weeks, two in three weeks, how many cities have already been effectively razed to the ground? Because all the damaged buildings have to be taken down anyway. You can't, they're not livable. That's dangerous. So, you know, that destruction, the cultural destruction, but also the destruction for his own vast Eurasian empire, how, you know, 
how the Russians have to live, ordinary Russians under that uh, sanctions regime, and how they're cut off from the world. Uh, and that's, that's huge damage for longer. It has thrown Russia back at least 30 years, I think. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's, for him, he's, he's pushing actually himself into the corner, not just in terms of the military campaign, but also, of course, how it looks for him as a leader in a country who has to somehow keep the people on board, also in his closest entourage of the advisors. I mean, look, even Igor Ivanov, a more hardline foreign minister, uh, from you know 20 years ago has come out and said you know this war uh, was a was a, was a very very bad idea on the side of Russia and it has made Russia into a pariah state it has broken yeah. the one thing it is you know the UN security the UN charter Russia is a member of the UN security council who is not on the UN security council Germany and Japan as culprits of World War II now Russia yeah. a member on that council has you know been the aggressor and is destroying the possibility for any resolutions where the world community could come together on uh, paragraphs and articles and principles and norms they have all signed up to so we are seeing actually the 19th century behavior that you know power trumps principles and that is something which you know tells us that what has been even in the cold war context we had tried to have some kind of principle framework, some kind of fora, that's been completely undermined because one of the biggest powers in the world and the biggest nuclear power in the world has now destroyed belief in those treaties, has ripped up effectively uh, those agreements. And of course, in order to function, we need, you know, even when we are in different positions, even when we have different national interests, to somehow be able to cooperate, we need to have avenues, we need to have some fudged principles and compromises that we at least can talk some kind of common language, even if we defend different interests. And that is so problematic about this war. Sorry. Do you believe um, uh, Putin's um, support base, uh, you were talking about the Russian people. I mean, I I presume the people may not matter very much, but the uh, military political establishment that is behind him, uh, do you see any cracks, any fissures there? Well, you see, that's why I think it's interesting that, like I said, the former foreign minister, you know, who wasn't exactly like Andrei Kozirev in the early 90s, a sort of very reformist type, yeah. but actually somebody who's more uh, on, the, on, the, on the national conservative side has come out and said, you know, this war of aggression is simply wrong. So you can see that there's clearly unease, but there's so many levels of, of course, that security apparatus, the KGB, the militia, the police, the army, the navy, you know, there's all these different kinds of layers, which are all at the moment used also to keep the own country under control as much as trying, you know, in this mission to gather those historic lands. So we have to see also how from within the apparatus, how long people are go- willing to go along with it when it has so much repercussions all- also on the domestic situation for Russia at home as much as for Russia's position in the world. And we can see, you know, even with China, it's been uneasy. They haven't yet exactly positioned themselves on one or the other side. They're also hedging their bets. Yeah. Is the, um, do you think that, um, um, I mean, these cracks and these, the fact that the former uh, senior official in the Russian government has come out against Putin, um, would you, hazard a guess as to whether this disquiet has spread to the military because we keep seeing uh, largely western reports that the campaign has lost steam they're having a lot of logistical issues there there are questions being raised elsewhere uh, i mean what what is the truth to these reports well i think you know you also have to think how many conscripts have been drawn into this war to conduct a, a war with conscripts what is the, the you know these people the, what is their morale to go into a war when they were thinking they were taking part in some maneuvers these kids are yeah. 17 18 19 years old they're the twitter generation they're not you know the generation of world war 1 or world war 2 what's the purpose here they want to have a life now they're leaving yeah. their lives behind on the battlefield so you know i think on those levels that you know, also when you know the mothers and the fathers find out that their sons are now stuck in somewhere where they had no idea that their children were going uh, and they were used effectively as cannon fodder because that's what we are seeing with this machinery. You see, that's where the Ukrainian side is very interesting. They have been differently trained. They conduct special operations. They have they work in small group rapid reaction. These kinds of things. Whereas Russia is using that old style, full on the go um, yeah. mass mass military campaign. 
Um, but as I said, you know, it's at different levels. We, we don't even know really, you know, which are the people beyond Shoigu and Lavrov uh, and a couple of others who, who actually have his ear, who actually can get close because so far from the highest level down in the security apparatus, he's holding a tight grip. But in the end, we all know from history, you know, sometimes yeah. it only takes one or two people at the very top who, um, you know, stage a coup um, or eliminates the person. I mean, there's many things that can happen at the very top. There's also the question, remember, uh, 1917 revolution, it all began with bread. When there's nothing yeah. in a Russian fridge, that trumps television. So, you yeah. know, if there are people have nothing to eat, uh, there will come a moment, surely, when also the, m m m in a massive way, the Russian population would say, we cannot carry on like this for our own sake, irrespective of what's going on in the Ukraine. What does it matter to a person in Kamchatka or Novosibirsk what's happened in the Ukraine? Beyond, of course, they, of course they are Russian patriots. Of course they are proud for their culture. But all of this is getting tainted because of this war of aggression. And it doesn't any more work in relation to talk about the great patriotic war when the Germans invaded them, of course. And for that, you have had decades of reconciliation. And the German chancellor said that, you know, he doesn't want the reconciliation of, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years that's been going on between the populations at all levels yeah. to be destroyed because actually now the governments, of course, are at loggerheads because they stand on different uh, positions here. So I'm going to ask you to speculate a bit Looking, we are now in the third week of the campaign. Uh, going forward, say, of the week, 10 days, uh, what's your sense of which way things could go? This is very speculative, but... Yeah, and as you know, I'm a historian, not a, not a futurologist. But, you know, let me just say, and I said this actually in the very beginning when I was writing a few blogs, how we had gotten where we were and what the problem was in the longer term structurally for the international community. This war isn't going to end tomorrow or in one week. There will be at least some simmering, even if they come to some kinds of agreements. There will, there's always some misfirings. Pulling back is difficult. You know, this, this fighting, we will still be in this war in a week's time. We might see a little bit of a lulling simply because I said our, our, the history tells us, you know, whether you look at the Vietnam War or other wars, that after a few weeks, you know, each side needs to regather, needs to reconsider tactics, strategies, how you're going. You have one side that is defending tooth and nail uh, their country, their nation, their way of life, their way they want to be governed. Uh, and there's another country that has various ambitions expressed in different ways as regards to the territory, certain segments of the territory and what they want to achieve. The question is, will there be any kind of coming together that the talks continue so that over time you will begin to move out of this conflictual situation? But at the moment, even if you think, you know, last yesterday there was talk about talks and, oh, perhaps there is a first draft from the Russian side being put forward. Look where we are 12, 24 hours later. We are still seeing bombardments. We are, we are seeing exactly the same as we saw yesterday. And I think that next week we will still be, you know, in this horrible warfare with more refugees uh, on the one hand pouring out, with more people fighting to the, to the death uh, to defend their country and with the, with the Russians trying to, you know, pocket in, uh, in especially on the eastern and northern side and still trying to press to Kiev. So last question. Uh, you mentioned the word coup a little while ago. Uh, a, a coup, I presume, would come from the military. And if that does happen, what are we looking at? I mean, Russia then changes? Europe changes? I mean, what happens? I... I I really cannot speculate what kind of government would emerge in Russia. And it all depends also how then Russia will. I mean, every war ends at some point. And the, a lot will depend on in which way that exit from that war, which will be a long process. You know, if you look at other wars and the exits, they take months, they take years. Uh, then we will have to look at where we are at the end of that process and how then you build some channels of dialogue and what is your starting point as regards to also, you know, these foundational treaties I talked about. You will have to rewrite quite a lot and consider how is, you know, the institutional West. And by that, I don't mean like geographically, but the countries that sign up to particular types of governance um, and, and, and values and norms and principles. And that includes, for example, Japan as part of the G7, how everybody is relating after the war to Russia, wherever its boundaries may then be. And, you know, there's still lots of open question marks 
you know, for yeah. uh, Russia versus, you know, maybe Estonia, that NATO border, uh, Russia and Finland. Uh, there, there will be a lot in Europe. You have to see how realignments take place and where the final, you know, if you so wish, borders between Russia and what Russia sees as its direct sphere of influence will be uh, and, and, the, and the borders of that institutional West. Are because you, you see, the, Belarus, Belarus is also effectively at the moment, uh, you know, full of Russian soldiers. And yeah. if you look at the map, Putin would get exactly what he didn't want, namely a hard border between where the NATO eastern flank is and where the Russian influence sphere is. Whereas previously, you mm -hmm. had a whole bunch of countries that were sort of in between, more Russia leaning or more Western leaning. And, you know, that had given us a certain amount of stability. Mm -hmm. So if that ends, then we are again going back to the Cold War? Is that what you are hinting at? No, we are not going back to the Cold War. The Cold War was in some ways relatively stable. It was a competition between two superpower-led parts uh, of the world, you know, and, and, and had, this, uh, had the nuclear power, the mutual assured destruction. But of course, now we have more nuclear powers. We have that particular system has definitely moved to something more uh, multipolar. And remember, China has said it wants to be a world-leading power by 2050. That mm -hmm. development will continue. Um, you know, Russia has tried to reverse course, but of course now it has thrown itself also economically uh, back enormously. And we have to see how the Euro-Atlantic uh, area, the non-aligned area, areas, um, you know, China, Russia, how that will sort of balance itself out uh, and where will be, you know, possibilities to somehow start dialogue and cooperate. And, you know, it also affects even the open market, the world market. I mean, at the moment, Russia is completely isolated. And if you look at the map, you just see the biggest country in the world has turned itself into a pariah state. Fascinating, fascinating. Uh, Christina Spohr, uh, wonderful talking to you. Thank you very much for that insight. And looking forward to uh, seeing where this endgame actually plays out and how it plays out. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And yes, let's see. We are all observers. Thank you. <laughs> pleasure. Pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. And for those of you who have joined us on this uh, conversation, um, thank you for your uh, comments and observations. Uh, follow us on our YouTube channel. Subscribe to it. Uh, follow us on Twitter and other social media. Thank you. Good night.